I want to give you some kind of an intuitive feel for the mathematical formalism that we are going to introduce. Um, so let me start out with a review of waves. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think 15 minutes, it'll be enough time to do at least this part of it. Uh, so let's say we have um, a plane wave of electrons or some kind of massive particle. Do you guys remember the mathematical expression for plane wave? for like if I was dealing with electromagnetic wave or sound waves. You remember the plane waves, right? Kinda, yes? So I'm going to write down the same thing, except I'm going to claim that this wave somehow applies to electron. So I, I will start using standard letters we use in quantum mechanics for this wave function <laughs> or the description of the plane wave. I'm going to use capital Psi Everyone here has seen the Greek letter Psi or P-S-I. That's why I have the weird sound at the beginning, Psi. Good, OK. So this is the capital. Uh, I use the capital, ver I'm using the capital version right now because this is a function of both the time, oops, the position and time. So our starting place is that this electron can be treated like a wave, so there's a wave function that can be associated with the electron. Well, I'm going to say it's a plane wave, which means it must have some kind of amplitude, right? Yes, whatever this amplitude means, it has some kind of amplitude times um, the plane wave function. I guess, um, uh, let me uh, use complex exponential because um, yeah, it'll actually make better sense that way. So. Well, actually, well, let me start out with a real function, and then you will see why I was telling you that complex functions are required once you get into quantum mechanics. So if I'm describing this plane wave, I would say A times cosine of kx minus omega t, right? Yes? OK. Um, so with these relationships in mind, what would you say is the momentum of this electron? So momentum of this electron, could you express that in terms of some of the parameters that already specify this wave, this wave function? Like, so which parameter? K, right, the wave number. Because you remember what I was saying before, the momentum is Planck's constant divided by lambda. Now, you remember that K is 2 pi over lambda. So you could write this H divided by 2 pi times K. Or you could write this as H bar K. So momentum is h bar times k. Yeah. Um, all right. Can we somehow measure um, energy of this wave uh, of the electron, which is represented by this wave function? So if we want you to measure its energy, how would we do that? going to be related to the angular frequency, right? So let me rewrite this version in a similar way. So you remember that omega is equal to 2 pi f. So here, well, it's h over 2 pi times omega, or h bar omega. So if you have this as the wave function of whatever particle you are looking at, you could say it's energy is equal to h bar omega. And right now, it's going to be a little bit uh, unclear what we mean by this energy. Um, you know, let's just leave it that way for now. Because <laughs> I want to actually, 
I would like to draw your attention to the fact that we have energy and momentum, and that we have frequency and wave number, the combination of quantities that you are dealing with, the special relativity, you know, energy and momentum form a energy momentum four vector, and you've, I've claimed that angular frequency and wave number form the wave number four vector. Uh, but having said that, the rest of what we are going to do from now on is going to be non-relativistic. So <laughs> let me just leave this part vague, whether by this energy E, if I'm in the total energy or some fraction of mechanical energy like kinetic energy. So we'll leave that vague for now. We'll come, because you know, the whole idea of frequency of electron is vague anyway, right? Okay, we'll come back to that later, maybe. <laughs> So, but this is our starting place. Um, if we have this uh, function that represents our massive particle, then based on its uh, wave parameters, wave number, and the angular frequency, we can describe its momentum and energy. Now, what I want you to imagine is kind of a backward way of doing it, going the other way. So here, you were told what the wave function was, and then you had to figure out, that from knowing all the parameters of wave function, you had to figure this out. That kind of seems easy. So let me give you this as a challenge. So this flip side version of that is, I'm going to tell you that an electron can be represented by a wave. But I'm not going to tell you the actual form for that wave function. So I'm going to tell you that this is psi as a function of position and time. This is my electron wave function, or whatever. It may be a plane wave. Maybe it's not a plane wave. Like that other electron you saw, if it's going in circular orbit, that cannot be a plane wave, right? And what I'm asking you is, Given this, how would I measure momentum and energy? I want to have a process. So you know, I'm not going to have a, a neat little algebraic expression like this. But what I would like to have is momentum and energy operators. By operator, I don't want to get too fancy linear algebra. Um, all I mean by operator is some kind of mathematical operation I can apply once I know what the function is. Then I will get something back that I can associate with the momentum. So let me, let me put it a different way. I only have eight minutes remaining. Um, so here, it was easy to kind of get at this, right? because you could clearly see, oh, there's my wave number. <laughs> I'm done. Imagine you didn't know where all this were. What kind of operation can you do here that will pull out a factor of k? Derivative. Derivative? Kind of, right? Like chain rule. So if you imagine doing this, like take, imagine taking psi and take the derivative with respect to x, then from chain rule, that would actually get a factor of k out. Except you run into a little bit of a problem. Because let's take the actual derivative. I get, um, so, so a times derivative cosine. So that would be minus sine. So minus a sine kx minus omega t. And then derivative of the inside with respect to x. So I do get a factor of k out. But the problem is what I have remaining. The, if this was the same wave function, I could say, oh, you just disregard the wave function, the con coefi constant coefficient, that's what it is. But here, I don't have that. I instead, I get a different function. And I, if you did this, well, I guess you could do the second derivative. Um, so you are saying that if I take a double then I will get k squared, and so it'll be like um, it, it'll be like minus k squared a uh, cosine kx. So okay, so now this is omega, uh, sorry psi. So we could say oh, 
So take two position derivatives. You are going to get some number times the function itself back. Disregard the function. And this is, um, you can take this from here to get the momentum squared. That's what Javier is suggesting, right? All right, so that could work if all you ever wanted to know was momentum squared. But I would really like to know, um, I would really like to be able to get just the momentum itself. And really, this is where it's coming down to. Momentum is a vector quantity. Whatever formalism we have, I want to be able to generalize it so that I can say momentum is equal to h bar, the wave number vector. And I want to have a mathematical procedure that will be able to give me this. And if I'm doing double derivative, if it, I'm always restricted to this, then I'm always being forced to discard my direction information. Right? So as long as you're dealing with a real function, there's no way to get around the fact that you have to take double derivative. Because that's the only way you can go from cosine and come back to cosine. This is where if you use a complex exponential, you can actually come up with a momentum operator that has only one derivative. So let me, so let, let me just show you what it looks like. So, Let's say, all right, so we are not dealing with the real trigonometric functions anymore. We are going to deal with the complex exponentials. So exponential of i kx minus omega t, right? So we do the same idea again, derivative, a single derivative with respect to x, then taking the derivative of the outside, now it's an exponential. So now it doesn't change at all. So here, I can retain it as exponential of i kx minus omega t there. Get the same function back. And here, instead of, um, so I have i k, i k. Um, and you can see how this is consistent with what Javi was proposing before. If we take another derivative, I pull out another factor of ik, i squared gives me minus one. Yeah? But this now gives me a way to define this momentum operator. So, um, so this is what I would say. So you, know, you define a momentum operator p and this is how uh, the hat, it's the common operator notation. And this is how I'm going to define this operator. I wanted to define it in such a way that if I have this function, I act on it with this operator, some kind of mathematical operation that's well defined, like derivative. Then I want to say, well, it's a momentum operator. If I can, acting on this, if I get some number that is actually the momentum times the original function back. So with this derivative, I am already pretty close. I get k, but I have this unwanted factor of i, and I want h bar, which is not there. So all right, let's make those little fixes. So. The momentum operator P, what it should be is, all right, so I want h bar, right? I don't want i, so let's divide by i. And the derivative operator, derivative with respect to x. This is uh, what we call momentum operator. This is how we measure momentum in quantum mechanics. If you, or in wave mechanics. If we have a function, a wave function that represents some particle, then we can measure momentum of the particle by applying this, um, applying this operator. Now, sometimes you won't get the same function back, and what that means is the state that you're dealing with doesn't have a well-defined momentum. 
like this electron that's in an orbit that doesn't have a well-defined momentum because it's kind of going on a, on a circle. But if you have a plane wave, if you have a plane wave which does have a well-defined momentum because it's going in one direction forever and ever, then applying this will give you the momentum. Let me, um, so energy operator is, um, you get it along the same line. Um, so let me, since I'm running out of time, let me just give you what the energy operator looks like. With the energy, the energy operator is, well, we, you want omega out, so it'll be the derivative with respect to time, and you are going to get minus i omega, so get rid of i, so it'll have to be minus h bar over i, the derivative with respect to time. And I will tell you that this particular introduction <laughs> is a bit um, unusual. I'm pretty sure your textbook doesn't do it this way. But the, way I, the reason I want to in, uh, introduce wave mechanics starting out with these is because the Schrodinger equation, which is what we will work with for some time, it's actually super easy to memorize if you start out from the correct place. Because this is the Schrodinger equation. Let me write it down, and I will tell you how, why it's so easy to memorize, and how I have it, actually have it memorized. And I'm a little bit over time, let me just uh, finish with this. So this is what's called the Schrodinger equation, we'll deal more with this next week. So it says minus h bar squared over 2m, double position derivative, um, psi xt plus um, some potential as a function of position times psi xt. Uh, oh, I'm writing down the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So all of this is equal to um, minus. Is it minus again? Mm. Wait, I'm, um, well, let me, minus h bar, oh, I know what it is. <laughs> the version that you will see is actually i h bar, the time derivative um, for of psi of t. All right. Um, it's, so it's a plus i h bar because um, this minus 1 over i, that's equal to i. And this is uh, how I have it memorized. Um, all that Schrodinger equation is telling you is it's telling you that kinetic energy, momentum squared over 2m plus the potential energy is equal to the total energy. That's all that Schrodinger equation is telling you. All these complicated looking things that I wrote down, all that is is momentum applied twice divided by 2n. This is the kinetic energy. This is the kinetic energy or you know one half mv squared in non-relativistic mechanics. And the rest are just saying, you know, take that, add potential energy to it, you get total energy back. Um, so, you know, if you start out with this, it's really easy to look at this as just a very complicated differential equation, which it can be. But uh, if you start from here, which you can kind of figure out from here, which is based on very fundamental quantum mechanical assumptions, then this actually is not saying anything complicated at all. It's simply saying the total mechanical energy is kinetic energy plus potential energy, <laughs> which seems true. <laughs> um, and the consequences of this is coming from that idea of energy conservation. 